from the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. Paying for things at the checkout line has never been easier. You can just tap your credit or your debit card and be on your way. Or if you have a smartphone, most have an app like Apple Pay that does it all for you. It's the way of the future. Cash is dying. But have you ever thought about who gets left behind when we go cashless? The pandemic has only accelerated how quickly we're adopting cashless transactions. Many businesses don't even accept coins and bills anymore. But there are many Canadians and people around the world who depend on cash. People who don't have a bank account or a credit card. People who don't have smartphones or access to technology in the same way. Some countries, like Sweden, have begun questioning how quickly governments and banks should be embracing a cashless economy. We're talking to the Toronto Star social justice reporter, Brendan Kennedy. Brendan has reported on this, about how hundreds of thousands of Canadians are being forgotten when we go cashless this quickly. It's worth asking ourselves, what's the cost of losing cash? Hey, Brendan, nice to talk to you. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. So how are we seeing our society, our businesses here in Canada embracing going cashless? Well, I mean, even before the pandemic, Canada was among the least cash dependent countries in the world. This is a trend that had been ongoing for a number of years. You know, there's more than one credit card per person in Canada. The vast majority of people are comfortable doing online banking and back in 2009, it was a little more than half of transactions, about 54% were still being made in cash. But in 2017, that number was down to about a third. So we've seen with the pandemic, some of these trends are accelerated or heightened, but Canada was already among the least cash dependent countries in the world. Right. So we were well on that road already. And then now during the pandemic, obviously, our spending habits, uh, the way businesses want to interact with us and more specifically with our money, that's really changing, too. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's an increase in online shopping, an increase in contactless payment, all of these things that are done digitally using some kind of electronic banking, whether it's credit cards or PayPal or other forms of digital payment. And the Bank of Canada hasn't released hard data on this period, but we know from surveys that two thirds of Canadians say that they have used cash less during the pandemic. So it's likely that the trends that we were already seeing in place before the pandemic are going to continue. And that number of transactions that are made using cash, which uh, like I said, in 2017 was down to just 33%, that number is likely to go down. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is pretty obvious by businesses of why they want to go cashless is because we want to try to avoid touching the same surfaces as much as possible. That's one of the big things. And neither one of us are infectious disease specialists, but a lot of the recent data and research shows that surface transmission is kind of about the same risk as what, like touching a doorknob. It's something to think about, but it's not the main way that COVID-19 spreads. The WHO has said there's no evidence of transmission via cash, by coins or bills. And that being said, they do still caution people to practice good hand hygiene after handling cash and to wash their hands. But the science, the literature in terms of surface transmission, there's contention about it. There's some concerns that earlier studies had been exaggerated. While the science is kind of in dispute in terms of transmission by surfaces or fomites, the risk of contracting COVID-19 by cash is really not any different than touching a keypad or, like you said, touching a doorknob or something like that. So cashless is obviously easier for many people, but that's mostly true with people with maybe a certain amount of financial security or a certain amount of privilege. Who's being left behind as we keep moving towards a more cashless society? Going cashless is convenient for a lot of people. But in terms of who's left out, I would say they fall into kind of three broad groups. So the first would be people who do not have a bank account at all. The number is kind of in contention, but it's estimated to be between 1% to 3% of Canadian adults do not have a bank account. And those are people who are homeless or street-involved, undocumented immigrants, and the percentage of people 
who do not have a bank account increases the lower you are down the income hierarchy. So it's a bit of a dated stat, but there is an estimate that 8% of people living in poverty do not have a bank account, for instance. Compared to the broader population, it's a small group, but you know, even if it's just 1% of Canadian adults, that's still 300,000 people. The second group is lower income people who have a bank account but are not able to make unlimited transactions and are trying to avoid paying high banking fees. So banks limit the number of free transactions you can make in a month if you are unable to keep a certain amount of money in the account. So for lower income people who are not able to meet that sort of minimum threshold that the banks set, they are often paying high transaction fees after, say, a dozen transactions in a month. This can differ slightly from bank to bank, but in most cases, the people who are in that position are not really in a position to pay an extra dollar necessarily on a transaction, especially if what they're paying for is only, say, $5 or $10 or something like that. The third group, I would say, is seniors and people with disabilities and people who, for all sorts of different reasons, find digital banking or electronic banking difficult, either because the technology is a challenge or they have a disability that prevents them from doing it or it makes it more inconvenient. Or in some cases, this group prefers to use cash for budgetary reasons, that it allows them to stick to their budget easier. And for them, paying in cash is a way to avoid those pitfalls. So I would say the people who are left out fall into typically those three broad groups. There was a quote in your story that I found really, really striking. You spoke to Laura Tamblin Watts from CanAge, which is a seniors advocacy group. There was a really heartbreaking thing that she said about people who are being left out, especially people who are older. Yeah, I think, you know, she said that she would received several calls from seniors who were frustrated that during the pandemic, they were unable to pay in cash at a store that a store had refused to serve them because all they had was cash. She described the feeling of humiliation and the sense that they were kind of no longer welcome in society or that society was kind of moving on without them. And for some seniors, like I said, there is a technology barrier, but for others, it's just a preference and a comfort to pay in cash and to avoid whether it's inconvenience or just a discomfort with electronic banking. We'll be right back. By how quickly we're moving towards cashless payments, do you think that creates more inequality or quicker inequality? We're already seeing some evidence of this in Sweden, for instance. That country has embraced cashlessness more than any other country. And in Sweden, only around 3% of all transactions are now made with cash. The Swedes have always adapted quickly to new technology. They've been using internet banking for around 20 years, and mobile phone use is among the highest in the world. Some banks in Sweden are entirely cashless, but their government has actively tried to slow that transition as they realized when it was happening very quickly that lots of people were being left out. And there was a study in the UK in 2019, last year, that found that 17% of their population would struggle to cope with a cashless society and that poverty was the biggest indicator of cash dependency. So the Bank of Canada is aware of this back in May when there were more reports of merchants refusing cash because of the pandemic. They sent out a statement encouraging store owners to continue to accept cash, saying that if you practice good hand hygiene, there's no greater risk of transmission and that it disproportionately affects marginalized groups. So this is something that's on their radar. And I think for anti-poverty advocates and people who work with marginalized groups and They sort of caution against a rush to cashlessness that doesn't make a concerted and coordinated effort to include the people who are left behind. That UK report I mentioned, one of the lines in it was that if we sleepwalk to a cashless society, then we're going to leave millions of people behind. So I think that even if there is this push to cashlessness and, you know, which is undoubtedly more convenient for lots of people and for lots of businesses that there needs to be sort of a coordinated effort 
to include the people who are left out before that transition kind of leaves them behind. So a real concerted effort to assist people who don't have bank accounts to get them. And there would need to be a major effort in terms of increasing the digital literacy of some people who are left behind and to not simply rush forward without thinking about who's left out. Right. So the actual action of going cashless at its heart, there's an argument then that it's not just an economic decision. This is an ethical one too. Definitely. It wouldn't have a major impact on the economy. You know, the number of people who are unbanked is relatively very small, but from an anti-poverty perspective, 300,000 people, or it could be as high as 500 or 600,000 people in cities in the U.S., New York City and Philadelphia in particular, where those cities have mandated, have passed bylaws that require merchants to accept cash. The legislation, which was sponsored by Bronx Councilman Richie Torres, will penalize brick-and-mortar businesses who don't accept cash with fines of up to $1,500. There's no such requirement in Canada at the moment. As far as I could tell, it's not happening in Toronto. There is no movement afoot on that front. There's definitely no legislation or bylaws in the works. And I reached out to a a couple of downtown councillors and it was is not something that was on their radar. So that's something that potentially the city could explore in the next few years. So, Brendan, the final question I'll leave you with, and maybe it's a bit existential. I don't know fully if any of us can answer this, but especially in speaking to anti-poverty advocates and researchers that you have for this piece, Is the question then, how do we do this in a way that doesn't leave millions of people behind in the process? I think that's the big question. The trends are going in one direction and they're not going to go back. I don't think that the Bank of Canada is in a rush to eliminate cash. I think they still see the value in it and they're as concerned, I think, in some ways for different reasons as the Anti-Poverty Act advocates about leaving people behind. The big issue is just going back to that report I mentioned and this idea of like not sleepwalking into that transition because hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people are going to be left behind. And I think that the big thing is to do it in kind of an organized, coordinated way or you end up like Sweden where you're having to kind of like retroactively. Yeah, it's sort of like it's harder to put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to speak. So they're finding it difficult once they allow certain segments of the economy and stores to go entirely cashless, it's harder to turn those efforts around. It's harder to go back. And if you don't do it in a coordinated, organized fashion, then you are kind of scrambling in the aftermath to fix things. Brendan, thank you for sharing this with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's Brendan Kennedy, the Toronto Star social justice reporter on how our societies are going cashless. We're thinking not just about the economics of going cashless, but who gets affected the most as we keep making that transition to the future. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Sabah Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.